I wasn't here last week. You guys crushed it. Mom listened. She said it was great. It was really good. You guys had a bunch of people in here too, huh? Yeah, we got five. Five. Ben, was it good? Okay. So we got Brian. We got myself. We have Tasia. And we have Jennifer back again. Um, second Samuel 6. All right, I'll pray us in and we'll go. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this group we have gathered here. Um, thank you for their hearts for you. Just pray, Lord, that um, whatever we say is, is your will and your words and not our own. And pray that we would glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Second Samuel 6, moving the ark to Jerusalem. Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abed. Abinabadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ao and Ab Abinadab's sons were guiding the cart that carried the Ark of God. Ahio walked in front of the Ark. David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nekon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. David was angry because the Lord's anger <clears throat> had burst out against Uzzah. He named that place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah, as it is still called today. David was now afraid of the Lord, and he asked, How can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told, The Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God. So God went there and brought the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. After the men who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and blowing of ram's horns. Michael's contempt for David. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. When she saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. They brought the ark of the Lord and sent it in play, <coughs> set it in its place inside the special tent David had prepared for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. When he finished his sacrifices, David blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Then he gave to every Israelite man and woman a crowd in the crowd, a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people returned to their homes. When David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came to meet him. She said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as the leader of Israel. The people of Israel are the people of the Lord. So celebrate, I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls who mentioned you mentioned will indeed think I'm distinguished. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, remained childless throughout her entire life. <clears throat> what a comeback by David. <laughs> I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and his family. Take that. He went from being really humble. Uh -huh. He's like, nah, let me get this jab in there. Have you have, uh, y'all ever heard the song Undignified? Undignified. So, have you ever heard that? No, I think I'm more yeah. undignified than this. It's based upon the scripture. I think Crowder wrote it years and years ago. <laughs> it's a cool song. I need, I need that made me find it. it. Find it, Brian. I'm going to find it. Just don't. Sure. Dance. Just don't dance. You want me to sing it? No, you yeah. Don't. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Come on, man. Um, yeah, so David gets his men, 
decides to bring the, the Ark of the Covenant um, to Jerusalem. What about God? You know, this thing's about to fall down and Uzzah decides to, hey, let me steady it and make sure it doesn't fall. And God's like, no, nah, you're dead, dude. <laughs> it's just a, a, a different time, I guess. I don't really know, yeah. you know, like. So I looked into that because uh-huh. it, like it surprises you. Um, I don't know. It surprised me. Like you go from celebrating and then you're all of a sudden just like, oh, he's dead. <laughs> um, and it, it, <coughs> reading it here, you think like, well, he's just trying to help. He didn't mm-hmm. want it to fall. And so I looked at it and back in, so it was, I don't, I don't know if this is total fact, but like, in Exodus, it talks about how the ark should be carried Mm -hmm. and it's specific wood and it's gold plated and it's, um, has to be like sea cow skin covering it. And it's supposed to be carried by men. And, um, here it's on a cart and on oxen and back in second Samuel, I wrote it down. No, first Samuel six, it talks about how the Philistines carried the ark and they carried it on a cart by oxen. And so I just wonder if it's God's way of being like, no, 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 this is a new rule. This is a new reign. And just because they did not respect me, how I clearly laid it out, like I'm not going to let that go again. Yeah. Because who knows? They wouldn't have, you know, it says the oxen tripped. So I mean, if the men were carrying it, you know, it was different. And like, if he laid out guidelines of, Hey, this is how, cause it refers to the Ark of the covenant of like, this is the name of the Lord, the almighty, mm-hmm. you know? And if he's saying, Hey, this is how I should be carried. This is how I should be presented. And then you don't, I don't know. Like it gave a little bit more. Oh no, yeah. Enduring word. Yeah. Now that I'm, word, it says that it says transporting the Ark on a cart was against God's specific command. Mm-hmm. The Ark was designed to be carried Exodus 25, 12 through 15, and was only to be carried by the Levites of the family mm-hmm. of Kohath. Mm. so they were not doing that so yeah makes sense yeah yeah i read that as well that there are specific instructions and numbers of how you're supposed to transport the car and one thing that i was listening to skip helsing um he was talking about this passage and saying that the ark of the covenant was actually the only place at that time where god said that he would meet you to atone for your sins so if you take the ark away and you're use manipulating it the wrong way then there was no hope and there was no place to atone for it so like it was really super sacred and when i first read it i was like taken aback that Uzo was killed i was like whoa like (laughs) that's like a little bit much but i think oftentimes in today's culture we want god to be like gracious and merciful and loving but we don't take like we can't just have a person that's like that and like you guys are parents so you know that you can't just always be gracious and merciful to try. So if he's like punching you in the face, you have to actually punch him right back. In the face. <laughs> strike that. him dead. <laughs> Maybe not strike like him dead, but there is, you know, consequences for not following the way. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I, Piggy, you know, <clears throat> piggybacking off of that, um, when I read it, and what's cool about um, this whole podcast, the way we're studying it is. I've never read the Old Testament like I do now because I used to read it as a story. Yeah. Because like you just want to get to the New Testament because that's what Jesus said and all Paul's instructions. But you'll read something like this; it's just a story. Mm. But if like when we do this, it makes us look into it a little more. Mm. And of course, I may be fabricating this whole concept of what I'm thinking, just like the stuff I was talking about before. Yeah. But the two the two sons of Abinab is who carried the, who was in charge of moving the cart. All right, if you do the history, which I did, the cart had been at Abinab's house, I mean the the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant had been at his house for 20 years. Well, Since the Philistines, since they returned it. Yeah, because they sent it back on and those I, cows. And this is coming off of what she said because we do sometimes you get just a custom to God is this merciful, mm-hmm. he's good, and he is all yes. that. And you lose the, the awe of fear. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, God's never, like, not the fear of like, oh, here comes a grizzly bear in my kitchen, but, you know, we're called to have this holy fear mm-hmm. of reverence to God, because he is God. Like, he is our best friend, but the same token, he is God. Mm-hmm. And I just think that maybe, like Uzzah, I mean, if you spend 20 years, I think he just got comfortable mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. around the ark. You know, I mean, just the fact that he had been in his house, he had, you know, God had been blessing them for 20 years. You just become, you know, yeah. like it's, 
it's maybe normal. I don't know that. Yeah. But if he would have, like, like you, you guys are saying, if he would have really studied the law of what it said, how to transport the car and, and the requirements of God, there's no way he would have put a hand on it. Like, yeah. I, no have, I put in my notes very similar to what you're saying is like, we don't know his heart posture either. You know, God knows his heart posture and, and how he reached out to it and like just getting comfortable and just, you know, whether it's the Philistines or Uzzah's heart um, with that, like I put here, like I can't start to think God is less holy just because others seem to get away with irreverence or not respected or something like that. And I feel like that was just something that God might be teaching of like, well, just because they seemingly got away with it doesn't mean you can, you know, I, I expect more out of you. Yeah. Um, I think too, like something that got me thinking was um, like, is sincerity enough? Because like looking at the passage, we can guess, we don't know for sure, but that they were sincerely trying to get the ark back for good reasons. They weren't <laughs> trying to like do anything bad and they did and went about it the wrong way. And it was like, is sincerity enough? Like, you can be sincerely wrong if I go to like a surgeon and he's like, Hey, this is my first surgery. And you know, I think I'm pretty good. I'm not positive, but like, I'm going to give a sincere effort. Is that enough? And sometimes I think we think it is, but it's not. it's not. And so like asking ourselves that question, like when we're doing things like is sincere enough and it's not. And I think, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. If that makes sense. No, it makes sure. perfect sense. Yeah, just because you have good intent right. doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's always it's the right. right thing to do. Yeah, it says here, it says God wanted the, <clears throat> the ark to be carried because he wanted nothing mechanical about the ark, representing his presence. The ark mm -hmm. was nothing less than a burden of the Lord, and the burden of the Lord was to be carried in the hearts of the Levites. He said, we can imagine what these men thought. Look, we have a new cart for the ark of God. God will be very pleased at our fancy new cart. They thought... Um, thought that a new technology or luxury could be uh, could cover over their ignorant mm. disobedience. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, read the next part, which I, I think this... Yeah, it says, we want God's very presence, don't we? Uh, but we like to hitch his presence to some of our new carts. We like to add yeah. him to our list of organizations, to load him up on top of the mechanics of a busy life, and then drive. How much of our service is really in the energy of the flesh, I wonder. So often we put forth our hands, but not our hearts. Yeah. Mm. So that... that <clears throat> saying that about the new stuff there's a passage in jeremiah when um, as we read this on our phones brian yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. there's a passage in jeremiah um where when when israel was rebelling and jeremiah the prophet obviously was was prophesied against them where he says you know to return to the old ways you know telling the israel to return to the old ways and in this whole modern this this analogy of like the the modern um technologies and things we like to, to hitch Jesus to. Um, it's because I think everybody's saying this, and I'm, I'm very guilty of it, but we justify a lot of the things that we do because that's just the culture, yep. yeah. okay? It's just, even in the church, like yeah. people dress like this or people watch mm -hmm. this and our people, you know, it's just, but it's okay because that's what everybody does, like mm -hmm. even the church. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so it's like this the song we're casting crowns is in the made the yeah. slow fade. Slow fade, yep. Like yeah. it's who's guilty? I mean, I'm guilty of that in my life where I've just you allow a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and then you wake up one day, you're like, How the hell did I get here? Mm -hmm. What's the other or one? Or we that just they like have? throw a choir one. robe on, you know, instead of gossip we say, Oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll pray for you. And you're just like throwing a choir robe on something mm -hmm. with like this bad intent, you know, but it, it looks or sounds like you, um, yeah, like that slow fade of just little things getting farther and farther and hitching God to even things we say, if they're not, we don't mean them like sincerely. Um, it's good. It's, we're getting up. You yeah. Know? You just, you get in routines and we're all guilty of it. I mean, Every one of us has, I guarantee, like life routines that it just, it, we don't even realize we do it. It's just part of our life. And it's the same way spiritually. Like, you just start. I mean, <laughs> how many of you have ever read? You, you've probably done this. Like, in the, like I'm reading our devotion sometimes. And then I'm like, what the heck did and I just read? And I read a whole <laughs> chapter. I'm like, what? And then you what put I it did, down and you, I go to bat day and I'm like, I don't even, what, don't even, what Yeah, what I, I just read? I've been trying to, like, throughout the day. 
remember what I read that morning because I, mm-hmm. I it's such, especially with, <clears throat> you know, when I wake up, I'm usually woken up by one, woken up, whatever, by one of the kids waken awake. I'm usually, aw- I'm usually awakened by Trice. Uh, and so I just, you know, there's so much going on. I'm trying to get my reading and I usually listen to it while I'm drinking coffee. I usually read the comments and, you know, comment back while I'm drinking my coffee, but there's noise, there's kids, you know, it's just, it's, there's today actually, yeah. it talks about how Jesus goes by himself Yeah, yeah. and, and you know, gets away from everybody mm-hmm. up on a mountain or wherever he's at or across the lake. And I think there's some validity to that mm-hmm. of, Hey, get by yourself, yeah. get in a quiet place. And I just, I don't do a good job of that. If we're being honest, my life and as, as bad as it sounds, is so busy that I'm trying to fit God in instead of the opposite, you know, like mm-hmm. it, I should be the one that, you know, but, but what's cool is like your intentions are right. Well, intentions are right. But so it's like, like Tasia's yeah. saying, it's like, what does it matter exactly. if your intentions are right? Exactly. You could still be wrong. Sincere? Yeah, mm-hmm. it, you know? it is. Cause you're just checking it off. But it's still, sometimes. it's checking it off sometimes. You know, there's days. And that's what I always tell people about just faith or with fatherhood or any of it. There's days where I'm really good at it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, heck yeah. But you gotta have a short memory because what's tomorrow? A new day. And in the in the opposite there's days where i do a really bad job of it on both or one or the other and so you have to have a short memory on those days too it's like fitness you know like Mm -hmm. the consistency is what's going to get you there Mm -hmm. it's not you know you can't you can't be too hard on yourself hypercritical on yourself on the bad days but you can't pump yourself up and pump your chest up on those good days either yeah Yeah, I think it just makes me think of, I'm going to butcher the quote, but like the devil will make you busy, right? If you're so busy. Idle hands, yeah. Yeah, idle hands. Um, If he can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Yeah, if he can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And so being diligent, I know we're talking in Samuel right now, but obviously the other Bible study we're in is Matthew. And we see that so much that Jesus, he prioritized that. Like when he was upset, when he was happy, like the first thing he did was go spend time alone with his father. Mm -hmm. And... That's a great reminder just for all of us to prioritize that. Even when we feel something like David, like David's first reaction when Uzzah died is he was angry. He was like super Mm -hmm. angry and that's super relatable to me. I think I'd be angry too. But at some point he had to humble himself and come back to God and be like, okay, how am I actually supposed to do this? Yeah. I wondered about that too, because you look at it and I mean, David is throughout the Bible known as a man after God's own heart. And then you look at it and he's, angry and just leaves the ark for months and it's like okay and then he comes back and i just wonder if in those months he went back and like remembered all the ways god was faithful and remembered like his goodness and how he brought him through and probably remembered oh hey we weren't carrying the cart how we were supposed to and um coming back to that and i think that's just like god seeing that of like hey he's unwilling to leave like leave God at a distance instead try and learn more about God and come back to him in that way you know like oh wow and I think that's kind of like after his own heart well let me try and find out God's heart and come back to him instead of just turning his back to it yeah you guys were talking about slow fade earlier and for some reason Mm -hmm. the song start right here is the one I was Mm -hmm. thinking of and it's so good like it says we want our coffee in the lobby we want to watch our worship on screen we want to rock star preacher uh, we won't, <clears throat> who won't wake us from our dreams. We want our, our blessings in our pocket. We keep our missions overseas, but for the hurting in our cities, we even cross the street. And it's just like those things that it's just comfort, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it says, uh, we want to see the heart set free and the tyrants kneel, the walls fall down and our land be healed. But church, if we want to see a change in the world, we need to start right <clears throat> in the world out there. We need to start right here. Mm-hmm. And it's just so many times do we, you know, like we're saying, you get comfortable or you try to justify, well, I'm in, you know, I've got my coffee, but I'm in church or, you know, we've got, you know, I like going to church because you like the preacher or, you know, you, he has to agree with everything that you agree with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so <clears throat> doesn't make you uncomfortable. doesn't, you know, challenge yeah. you in certain ways that it's, it's going with the, with society or with, you know, yeah. what everybody else is doing. Yeah. This morning when we, in the, in the reading of Matthew, I think it's, it's going on what everybody's saying, what you just said about um, Jesus was talking to the people and basically said, you know, I'm not concerned what's coming in, but what's coming out yep. is, is a byproduct, he said, of directly of your heart. heart. Yep. And, it's not uh, what comes in that defiles you, but what comes out of your heart. And I, you know, I think 
when I read, when you talk about David's anger, <clears throat> I think our heart can do, I was, and I comment on that, my heart is such a challenge for me because I wake up in the morning and my mind seems to be like on point. Like when I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I really spend time in prayer, I have my day figured out. And then I, I get into this uh, scenario, this environment, and then something happens that I don't like and I get angry. And so, so I'm in this flesh, this battle where my mind and my, my heart are a competition with my, for my spirit. My, mm-hmm. my heart is flesh. I think my mind's been transformed by the renewing of God, but I just can't, can't connect I can't two. get it to, you know, to operate. <clears throat> like, and so for David, I think what's good when you said he got angry is he went back for three months Mm-hmm. And when he came back, we see that he, like, they didn't put it on a cart. Yeah. So he figured it out in yeah. three months. And how much you know? do he, we, when we, those small fades, those few things, like, we know. Mm-hmm. Even when we do it, we, we deep down know, hey, this isn't right, but it's not fully wrong. And I think David, he knows God. He spent enough time with him. He's talked to him enough that I think he did know. But when your celebration is met with disaster, which is in, in like a moment, you respond. Like he mm. knew it up here, but his, or maybe the other way around. Um, but yeah, I think, I agree. I think he knew. I think it's hilarious that David's like, I don't know what to do with this thing. Let's give it to this Obed Edom. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Leave it in his house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see if it kills him. Yeah, if it kills him, then we'll just leave it there. But yeah, I mean, you know, at first, like you're saying, did David know? And, you know, his response is anger at first. And how many times have we been, you know, questioned God? And you see here, David is a man after God's own heart, but he still had that, you know, that flesh that was like <clears throat> mad at God. Yeah. And so you're kind of like, huh, you know, I David, just, oh, I sorry, you what David we... can do it then. I just you know. thought when, go, like going back to the cart and as a kid, go into like my parents and be like, yeah, but so-and-so did it. Mm -hmm. And my parents are like, those aren't my kids. Right. I don't care if they did it. The Philistines did it. Yeah. used to be like, if if your buddy ain't Jump off the bridge. Yeah. You're going to eat it too? I'm like, And I I think that was just kind of like the the sobering moment maybe for David is like, but they did it. And Mm -hmm. God's like, they're not my kids. They're not my people. I, I, I taught you and raised you better than that. Yeah, no, I mean, for me, I definitely feel like I can relate to David in this. I actually underlined that he was angry, and most of you guys know me, I'm not traditionally an angry person. Uh, (laughs) Um, Lies. Yeah, (laughs) but like, I mean, it's pretty much out there that I'm not competing this year, and originally when I started not feeling great after 2020, I was like really angry with God, like super crazy angry, um, to a point that, yeah, I didn't really understand, and Something that for me, which I'm not going to speak for David, but I felt like I really related to this passage was at first I was just kept praying for healing. Like I was like, God, heal my body, help me feel better. And for months that wasn't coming to fruition. And so I felt like God kind of was leading me to pray a different prayer and like pray to open my eyes and change my perspective. And when I saw in here, I wrote down that David didn't remain in his anger, but humbled himself once again. That was really telling for me because I felt like it was God helping humble me that like I, he, I'm not entitled to anything on this earth. Mm -hmm. Like God doesn't owe me anything. I don't own the spot on this team. I don't have, I'm not entitled to compete if I want to compete and all these other things. I'm not even entitled to my health. And just remembering that like everything that I have is from God, like that's what I took from this. And I can, I've already felt God's peace and blessings from this transition, but to see that anger can switch so fast to celebration and like joy is like, I really related to David here. And I think that that's good for all of us, right? Sometimes maybe we have to change our perspective and like slow down and wait on the Lord and then try again. Cause David did try again. He just tried it a different way. Yeah, no, so I think true. that's great. Yeah. So we, really good. we think we always know what's best for us. Mm. And sometimes God's like, no, this, that's not yeah. what I want you to do. Yeah. I was on a phone call uh, yesterday morning, maybe the day before, right after prayer with my best friend in the world. And we grew up together and I was, not, I mean, I, there were some things I wasn't happy about. I was, you know, kind of angry and just like, I don't know why. I mean, I'm on day 18. I've been praying for 18 days. You know, we're in this 21 days of prayer and I'm coming to the end. And I'm like, 
I've been asking God to change this, you know, mm -hmm. because this is what my problem is. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he just, just turned it on me. And he mm -hmm. was like, but, but this is what God's doing in your life through your situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what we see. Mm -hmm. yeah. You may not like it, right. but this is how I'm responding to it because I've seen you do this and this and this. And yeah, I don't, I'm sure you don't like where you're at the same way with you, but, mm -hmm. and just even in Tasia, like, I don't mean, I don't know what, what, what entails like internally because, because I'm not, I'm not a competitor mm -hmm. like that. So what she's stepping away from, but I also know like in the time that you not, you know, you're not spent as much time training. Tasia's like doing all these other things like yeah. like the missions and people are like, so you're impacting lives in all different around way. you, yep. like in this mighty way, but at the same token, you're probably not in the space you want to be in. But I think that's too, which thank you so much for saying that's really nice. Um, I feel like I've had that God has given me, he's opened my eyes and changed my perspective to see the greatness that's mm -hmm. outside of competing. And that's why obedience is so important. What I've learning is I knew God was calling me into this space, but I continued to be disobedient because I was holding on to what I thought was right for my life. And within a step forward into obedience, just like David here, he walked into obedience of the instructions of like carrying the ark. Then it was met with immediate celebration. And although I'm not like, you know, like mm -hmm. this right now, I definitely do feel the joy and peace of that separation um, from there. So. And to just... I mean, David wrote the Psalms, you know, and he's talks all through that. It was like creating me a new heart, you know, and I feel like with competing, it's okay, Lord, like you, and I don't know this, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I know like personally for me, when I was going through my divorce and like mad and all that, and I was like, all right, Lord, you're, you have to create in me a new heart because what my current heart wants is not what is not what's happening and just yeah like taking that step forward and him saying okay i want to do a new thing and like the invitation of like that's an invitation of god to experience him and know him in a different way and and to like david have a heart like his you know like you have to create in me a new heart because my heart right now is not like yours and i want it to reflect that um, so I just, yeah, I think it's an invitation. Um, we don't always want to RSVP yes to, but. Yeah, it's tough <clears throat> for sure. Um, so David brings the ark from Obed's house to Jerusalem. Um, this is when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Um, this was elaborate, excessive, over-the-top sacrifice. This excessive sacrifice communicated atonement, consecration, and longing for fellowship. And so we had a little discussion before this. Did he do it every six paces the entire time? Because it doesn't, well, it doesn't necessarily... When those bearing the ark of the Lord had you gone six paces. Way, yeah, I, so I, does it only that one time? Or if he did it every time? It just says, when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces. That he's, So you could read it like... Every six every, paces? When they went six paces. What was would, the math on that? That means every 15 feet they would have stopped <laughs> and sacrificed two animals, which had been 343 sacrifices per one mile. Mile. Which would have been basically 700 animals. 700? A mile. 343 three, 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 times two. Yeah. 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 That's a lot. If that's the case. And then you're <laughs> 680, yeah. And I forget how many miles Pastor Chris said it was from where that house was to Jerusalem. 70 like ish miles. But it was like, like 20 something that? thousand sacrifices of an, like 20 something thousand animals. PETA would be. I don't be know. Pissed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that it, we're not quoting that as fact. Well, yeah, uh, we don't know. It, it but, only says the one time, but it doesn't. It doesn't say they didn't. Those do it. bearing had gone six paces. I don't know. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's been a long trip. For sure. <laughs> like I'm going away for a couple months to get the. It says First Chronicles fifteen eleven through fifteen shows us that David specifically commanded the priests to carry the ark the right way on their shoulders. We often think that a new cart or strength or a friendly manner is the way to bring the presence of glory of God, but God always wants His presence and glory to come on the shoulders of consecrated, obedient, praising men and women. 
It also showed that David brought the Ark of Jerusalem with a big production, bigger than the first attempt. David was wise enough to know the problem with the first attempt wasn't that it was a big production, but it, that it was a big production that came from man and not God. So David also danced in front of the Ark, <clears throat> which is kind of a an interesting, I guess, thought, or I guess, you know, you think about it, um, just a picture, I guess, the king. Usually, most mm. of the time, you see a king very, you know, somber or reserved, reserved or um, just kind of there. Um, and he was dancing and singing and playing and just kind of going crazy. It makes me think of those, uh, is it Sedona that has a picture of the, um, it's one of them, their logo is like a dancing I think is Native American or some type of native, but that just makes, I don't know, that picture is what I think of of David when, you know, mm-hmm. dancing in front of the ark. Yeah, I think it's a good reminder that, da- like, worship isn't about us. It's not about you. Like, it's about the Lord. And so, like, him acting kind of like a little wild and crazy, like, to him, he was just worshiping God and not thinking twice about it. But mm-hmm. to Michael, she's like, hmm, you know, and I think that can be seen in church too today or how people do that, like, a place of judgment. But it's really not about... Like what I do when I worship doesn't have to be what you do when you worship yeah. and that's okay as long as you're worshiping God. So that I thought the exact same thing when I read it. I was like, how many times have I been in church and been like, what are they doing? <laughs> and it's like, oh man, worshiping, <laughs> you know, there's a freedom in it. I mean, Pastor Chris always compares worship, you know, the same as like, you know, going to a football game. Yeah, that's what it says here on Enduring yeah, Word. I just, and, and, I, and I feel... You know, I don't know if I should feel guilty because the excitement, like if I'm at an Auburn football game. Oh, it's way different. I, and like yeah. the, the, you know, the bleachers are rocking. Like mm-hmm. in every play, I'm just, yep. you're just screaming. Like, mm-hmm. I, I yell mean, at the TV that, in my in my living room. Yeah. Huh? yeah I, said, I yell at my TV in the it, living room. Hillary gets so mad at me. You can, so they can't excited. hear you. Yeah. I'm like, but they can. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, the, in, he, our worship, I mean, our our enthusiasm for God whether we portray it that way or not, should be at a higher level than any sports event. For sure. Or how we pull for a team. It is. Yeah. But we get there and you're just, and I do it. Like, I mean, I, I love to worship and I worship, but it's still at the same token. Like there's been times I just love to just get crazy. I feel like my worship is usually better when it's, when we're working out in the middle mm-hmm. of a workout and I need it, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. then that's usually where my, my worship is in a different place, you know, yeah. but also we're wired a little bit different than, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily. It's hard for me to get hyped at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, listening to praise and worship versus mm-hmm. at three or four o'clock when we're doing a hard workout or like a run mm-hmm. workout. Some of the best times that I remember are like uh, one of the times we we're out here running mm-hmm. on assault runners, which I hate. And, you know, some of the songs come on the playlist. Yeah, yeah there's, it's just awesome, you know, mm-hmm. like, that was um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it's just different, you know, like yeah. some people are wired different, but it does say, it says, <clears throat> we don't think that dancing is strange when a baseball player rounds the bases after the game winning home run. We don't think it's strange when winning touchdown is scored or when our own child scores a goal. We think nothing at hands raised at a concert or a touchdown. We should not think them strange in mm-hmm. worship of God, which mm-hmm. makes perfect sense as well. Yeah. So, yeah. It says David was wearing the ephod. There it is again. <laughs> the ephod, with the humming and the drumming. I don't remember what is that. Yeah. Is this made the two rocks? yeah, you hear people. I've heard people try to describe David when he was, um, that his wife was mad because he was not dressed, mm-hmm. which is not true. He just had on priestly, like he had on the ephod instead of his uh, kingly garments. Yep. And like Taja was saying, he just, it was, she was upset because she felt like he wasn't presenting himself. In a kingly manner like her father? In a kingly manner <laughs> like her father. But, yeah. but listen to this. Clear that, listen to this though. She despised him uh, yeah. in her heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. David's wife, Michael, didn't appreciate David's exuberant worship. She felt it was, wasn't dignified for the king of Israel to express his emotions before God. Wow, like, but if you're but despising, despised it doesn't matter what you do in her heart. That's ugh. so really healthy marriage. Right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, good marriage, good marriage. I mean, was there like because also it says you know that he was dancing like that in front of the servant girls or something. Mm-hmm. So I mean, was she jealous that like I don't know? There's some jealousy there. But it's, also, it's almost how like many it's, wives does he have? Yeah, it's almost like it's uh, <laughs> born into her. You know, like uh, Saul, very similar. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I see where you're yeah, I mean, says. who knows? I was but, like, well, I mean, if he's got a few other wives, maybe she has built up. Yeah, some heck yeah. I mean, but she should. But that goes back to why you shouldn't have multiple wives. You know, like 
the commentary said, um, you know, Michael, uh, from that point on, had no children to the day of her death. Mm-hmm. And, but it does not say, and that's, that's what the commentary said, it doesn't say that's because God made her barren. Or David. He mm-hmm. said maybe David just didn't decide not to sleep with her. Yeah. yeah. And left her high and dry for the yeah. remainder of time. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, it says David David did was humbling to him. He didn't dance to show others how spiritual he was. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like he was doing it to like yeah. get likes on Instagram. You mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Back in the day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. It says Michael's barrenness was not necessarily the result of divine judgment. It may be that David never had marital relations with her again. Nevertheless, the principle stands. There's often barrenness in the life and ministry of the overly critical. Hmm. Yeah. True. That's good. So true. You leave anything out? Anything else? I think it's good. Um, just, you know, as we close this out today, I think we can all testify to the, um, to the fact that to be really guarded and careful about becoming comfortable, you know, and becoming um, attracted all, all the time to the new ways, mm-hmm. you know, and not letting ourselves go with the flow when everybody's doing it. I think mm-hmm. just remind, using this, this story to remind ourselves that it will catch up yeah. you know, yeah. at some point. If we're not careful, we think we can just, you know, modernize the Word of God to fit the culture that uh, it's going to catch up. And <clears throat> unfortunately, um, sometimes it, it affects those around us you know we don't even sometimes like my daughter may i'm, I'm not saying it's the truth but yeah. somebody real close to may have to pay the price for you know us not walking the way god's called us to walk mm-hmm. you know whether it is a family member or a friend or something that you look back and you go well, if i'd have been done this doing this, this yeah. way like this wouldn't have happened so um it's a good lesson for me to uh not get comfortable because man i've so many mornings have went by that I've spent time with, in, with God, but not with God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. I check Checking a box. Yep. That's not healthy. Nope. I do like how it came around full circle from the beginning and then at the end. And it, like when David does come back to God and at the end, it's like so like definite of yeah. like, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become more undignified and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. Like just coming back to it's, it's, I don't know who said it, but like he had an aha moment of, Oh no, this is, this is right. And this is where I'm supposed to be. And how much more being off and then coming back sometimes like strengthens what you believe and why you believe it, you know? And it's like, Oh no, I I will celebrate. I don't care what everybody else says. Um, you know, just to, Close it just out. think about the most. <clears throat> I'll close with this. From the last thing I'll say is, I think about the most desperate time in my life when I was at like the worst, like needed God. Those are the times that Closest. I was undignified. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't care. Like I can remember just like in church or with small group, just weeping and praising and begging and seeking. And I really didn't care like, mm-hmm. if you'd have been like you're a wussy or whatever, right? Because I was so desperate for God, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and that's what I need, right? You know, because it's only in that 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 attitude will I ever be effective and you know productive as God's intended for me to be, right? Know? As opposed to because everybody prays when they're sick, always close you know, when you need them the most for yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. 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 When, so. when things are going right, we've talked about yeah. it multiple mm-hmm. times on here, it's so much harder mm-hmm. and it shouldn't be. You know, that's the thing that I, I'm trying to work on is when things are good, still trying to seek and, and be close. When things aren't going um, exactly how you want them to go, it's way easier to be oh, close yeah. to God 100%. and ask for help and, you know, seek Him and do those types of things. So. Mm-hmm. That's good. Anything? Any more yeah. notes, Tej? No. All right, you want to praise out? Sure. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for this group, God, that's gathered here today, Lord. Thank you for your word, for your promises, God. I just pray that we trust you better, Lord, this week. I pray that you open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, Lord. Um, 
please help us to do the right thing the right way and walk in obedience with you, God, and um, just protect us through this day, Lord. Please let this message touch anyone that's listening, um, and thank you for your sacrifice. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.